How's everybody doing? Thanks for being here. Anybody name the tune? play that much piano on it it's um, all too soon Duke Ellington how's everybody doing this Saturday morning thanks for hanging out with me I've taken a poll on uh, on Twitter and on the my YouTube um, little community tab and asked if you would rather have me play requests today or figure out licks and chords and whatnot together or do both. And it seems to be tilted a little bit toward figuring out things together, but also both. So I'd like to do that today. It's uh, sometimes it's just fun to, you know, pretend like we're all together. Um, let's see. Do I do online lessons? That's a good question. Um, I used to, uh, and then I got really busy, so I don't take any new students anymore. Um, yeah, but you know, never say never. But but yeah, as a rule, I'm not taking new students. Can we work on epistrophe? You're having trouble soloing on it. I remember when I worked on epistrophe, and I had trouble soloing on it. I haven't played that one in a long time. Um, yeah, let's listen to it. I want to be careful in listening to things so that I can still keep my video um, monetized. But so I don't know. So I'll, I think I'll listen with earbuds and then and I'll just listen, you know, not a ton like to leave you hanging, but maybe I'll just put one earbud in. And and then I'll I'll let you listen if, if I need to. Does that sound good? Does everybody know epistrophe? It goes between D flat and D, right? I think they're dominant chords. Like this. I re I think I learned this song from Eric Dolphy. Yeah, I think I did. I wonder if I can find that that recording. Does anybody know that recording? No, it's not on Spotify. It it might be on. Pretty sure, pretty sure I learned it, and it was like because we did um, my my quartet a long time ago. Like that. Like we tried to keep the melody in four four. Put the this in six eight, and that that was tricky, but it was fun. Um, but yeah, that's that is tricky. Okay, now let me just look up the uh, the chords for it to make sure. I th I'm sure they're dominant chords, right? But it, yeah, it just goes back and forth, so that's tough. Yeah, just back and forth between D D flat seven and D seven, and then. And then after four bars of that, it goes back and forth between E flat seven and E seven. And it does that for eight bars. And then it goes back to the D flat seven to D seven. And then the bridge is easier. The bridge is like a big long two five basically, right? Uh, but I mean, what I always like to do is to listen to somebody's solo and to get ideas from them. So I wonder if, um, if anybody has a recording of epistrophe that they like in particular, and and if we could um, listen and get some ideas from somebody, so let me see. If if you go to Spotify, you know, and you click epist and you do epistrophe, it'll say see all songs. And I like to do that because then it lists so many different recordings. There's a Bill Frizzell one that I haven't heard. Might be good. Um, of course, there's Monk with Train, and and just Monk. Um, 
Let's try let's try the Bill Frizzell. It's it's right at the top. Let me get into it a little bit. Yeah, it sounds tasty. Of course you guys can't hear it yet. Hmm. Okay, okay. So so here's a part. I'll let you hear it. Here's a part where he's taking these two chords and and he's using arpeggios. Let's see. So that's an idea, right? He's like um do, do. Oh, he that he was on the E flat part right there, but we'll, we'll go back to D flat. So it was like a So that's an idea, right? You can break apart the chord a little bit. What I did was start on the seventh degree. And I just played up on seven, root, three, five, and then you just transpose it up a half step. And then I went backwards on it. And then I and then I moved the inversion down so that now instead of a four three inversion, we have a six four inversion. So the on the D7 chord, we end up with the, the F sharp being the top note. And and of course. I mean, that makes it pretty diatonic and easy to hear, right? But if you wanted to do it with more complicated notes in your arpeggio, you could do that too. So maybe instead of, um, instead of the, right, uh, let's see what I do. Instead of that, you could do like, you could do an altered voicing where you've got the sharp five and the sharp nine. So we've got B, E, F, A. I know those aren't spelled correctly but it's easier that way uh, then you could raise those a half step right you could do like that like that's a great idea let me listen just a tiny bit more and see if I get any any more good ideas that's nice and here comes the bridge let me back up a little sorry it's so quiet Cool, cool. Okay, so here he takes he takes a scale, and I th it sounded Lydian dominant to me. Um, and and you can play that, but you can only play it for the what is it two beats that D flat seven is on. So so you can play a little bit of it, and then you have to shift modes all of a sudden in your head to be able to shift to the D to the D Lydian dominant scale. So back and forth, D flat Lydian. So that's an interesting exercise to practice, really. What if you started on the third of the D flat um, Lydian dominant scale? So we've got a F, G flat, A flat, B flat, but then here you go to the very next note that you can go to to play it in D, which would be a B. B, C, D, E, and then you go back. F, oh, that just does the... That's cool. If you just do four notes from each, since since it's a what is it eight note scale, then you could just do the same four notes over and over again, and that makes it a really it's almost like a scale in and of itself, right? F G A B C D E F sharp. That's cool. What is it? I I don't think it's anything other than what we just called it, right? I don't. Yeah, I don't think it's anything else. <laughs> it would be cool if I was like, oh, that's the seventh mode of the, you know, melodic minor scale or oh, it's something, but it's not. Uh, so that's kind of cool. You can mess around with that. You can start on a different note. You can play a different scale. You could play the altered dominant scale. But but the thing that Bill Frizzell did that I liked was that he did that for a second. He played from the two different modes or in the two different keys, and then he he did a tasty ending. Let me see if I can let you hear it. Like that. So he... Like that. Like he, he came up, he came down a little bit, he did a tasty ending. So, I mean, I prefer that, you know. And that's a good way to start your solo, too. Like, you could totally do that. Be all, like, sneaky, sidesteppy. Wait a second. 
do, do, something like that, you know, where you have like a, a line that makes sense in the end and you don't have to just play continuous scales because that gets really boring. Then maybe you add your arpeggios. If you just have a few trick up, tricks up your sleeve and oftentimes you can just find them from recordings. This is Bill Frizzell, Thomas Morgan, um, and the album's called Epistrophe. No, 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 it's not. It just says that here. Well, maybe it is. I don't know. It's, it's, they're live at the Village Vanguard. I don't know this album. So there is one thing for you, and I hope that it helps. Mm. Kevin asks how I would practice playing contrapuntal parts with independent dynamic schemes like Bill Evans. And have I ever heard anyone who could do it on guitar? Whew. Um, gosh, I don't know about the guitar question just right off the top of my head. Um, although Joe Pass was pretty darn amazing at that kind of stuff. You know, anything contrapuntal um, that, you know, involves thinking with both hands at the same time doing something different, um, I always say hands alone work is like you can't, you can't beat it. You have to, you have to be able to play hands alone before you can put them together and hands alone with a metronome as well. Um, not just hands alone, but I mean, I learned that, you know, in my classical practice that you, you are not ready to put your hands together until both hands can play alone at tempo. Then it's just a matter of slowing it way down again, like slowing it super, super way down, maybe like 40 beats per minute or something, depending on what you're working on. And, um, and working really, really slowly. Sometimes if you see it written out in front of you, like if, if you're playing something that, you know, you're, you're going to do exactly how it is, seeing it written out can help you to line up everything just visually and, and playing at a very slow tempo. But that stuff will take you a long time unless it's something that, that you can just kind of feel. That happens from time to time too. And it doesn't take all that much, you know, to figure out. But that's, that's my best advice. Slow, hands alone, metronome. Frank, you have done a super chat. How are you, Frank, man? Nice to see you. Ahoy, Amy, would you play September by Earth, Wind, and Fire? Or figure out some interesting part of it? <laughs> That's a good idea. I don't know that I've ever played September by Earth, Wind, and Fire on the piano. Not by myself, anyway. Let me see if it happens to be in the iReal Pro, because that'll help me to do it faster, won't it? We'll probably get September song and September in the rain. Yeah, September, it's here. Yeah, let's see. I might have to. I might have to listen to it too. But let's see if I can. The chords are like that. You gotta hear it. Do you remember twenty first of September? I don't know the words. Da, 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 da. Am I playing it too fast? I can't remember how the bridge goes. That's a fun one. That's a fun one to. Uh, that's a fun one just to sing, and and to and to do a little bit of like what Earth, Wind, and Fire does with the melody, which is to displace and syncopate sometimes, and to try to keep your playing uh, steady, right? Maybe that rhythm. hard when I got to that um what is it the fifth bar yeah. da, 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 da. to hit that one two let's it's like one two three four one on the end of four but not to do it with your voice da, da. Yeah, 
that's nice. I don't know what interesting part anybody would have for me to figure out. Uh, there probably is one. If you think of one, Frank, give me a timestamp. I'll go listen to it. And that'll be fun. And you don't have to do much either. I mean, if I was playing with a band, the bass player would be nailing all of this stuff, right? I don't even know what the bass part is. <laughs> Something like that. Should we learn the bass part? That might be advantageous. That, that might be a great idea. For me, too, I'd, I'd love to learn the bass part. Um, let, me, let me listen to it. Looks like I've got an Amazon delivery. <laughs> There's a van outside my house. Guys, I'm ordering some exciting stuff. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to start making some fun videos in the ocean. That's, that's my idea, anyway. Oh, I gotta plug in my Mac. Hold on. I forgot to do that. Okay. okay, now we won't die. Very good. Now we're gonna listen to the baseline of September. Oh yeah, I wanna make some videos in the ocean. I don't know if anybody's really gonna care about it, but I decided that I like to be in the ocean and I would love to be able to make videos from my surfboard just sitting there talking to a GoPro and then turn around and catch a wave. So that's coming. I've ordered some very exciting equipment that's going to allow me to do that. Yeah, same key. So that's good. I got to have both earbuds. Give me a second. Sounds good. Give me a sec. Mm. Something like that. All right. Back to the thing. It's like... And then there's octaves. Right, what were those octaves? Those were really cool. I'll let you hear it. Uh, but. Oh yeah, like that. That's really cool. I love it when bass the bass does big old hops like that. It's super funky and nice. And and a little trick you know for playing funk bass lines is often and it happened here too is that anytime you have to approach something, if you do it by whole step underneath and approach by half step, that can always be tasty. So uh, here. We're coming to the F, F sharp minor, and then t coming to the D, or it would be more tasty. Sometimes it's more tasty to stay in the scale, but but oftentimes if you approach from underneath like that, and you hit on the end of two, and then you so you're hitting the roots on the end of end of two and on the end of four, that can drive your band. All right, good one, Frank. And now I have another super chat from Adam, and that's so nice, Adam. First ever super chat. Let's give it up for Adam. It's really nice. Any suggestions on how to learn chord changes to songs such as Giant Steps? Yeah, good question. So how to, how to actually learn the changes and not forget them? It's hard. Adam, you look young, so you've got that in your favor. Say the younger you are when you're learning difficult chord changes, the better for you because things stick in your brain so much easier when you're younger. Um, you need to find some patterns, some things that make sense to you about the chord changes. So if you can ever watch on YouTube somebody's video explaining, you know, explaining the tune, that's helpful. And, you know, lucky for us, Giant Steps has been thoroughly explained, especially in the, uh, the video where Adam Neely breaks it down. Um, he really, really, really does. And he has like a, this wheel that he holds up and he shows us all the relationships between the chords. But if you can make those chords make sense to you in some way, 
that's a good thing. I, I wrote a tune um, looking for the answers on my for my last album, and it has a difficult section in it that was actually hard for me to remember the chord changes to my own tune, and um, and it and they don't make a, they don't make a lot of sense. Like I I can't really wrap my head around why I picked those chords. They just sounded good where they did, so that's why it was really hard for me to remember. In that case, the thing that I do is they they happen to be alphabetical. I. I kind of know what they are. It goes, uh, let's see. How's it go? Um, uh, what do you all, what do you, uh, what is it? E minor. Always. Yes, it goes from E minor to A minor. And that makes sense to me. It's just the three minor to the six minor. Go looking for the A. And then it's like a D minor nine. Answers. And this makes sense to me too, because it's a two chord that goes to a like a um, it's a G over an A. So that's something that I probably play a lot, and that makes sense. The next part doesn't make so much sense to me. So let's see. Always go looking for the answers. So far from where you start. So that right away my, my melody launches into a different key and, and it's a B flat minor chord. Started. We go B flat minor to E flat minor. And for me, it's really hard for me to remember which one of those came first. Is it B flat minor? Is it E flat minor? But I so I just have a little trick that it's alphabetical. The B flat comes first, B before E. And then and then it happens again. Uh, away from what you know. And that goes to C minor to G minor. And once again, they're alphabetical. The C comes before the G. So those are kind of weird changes that are hard for me to remember. But if I, I've got a couple of them in mind and I just memorize it alphabetically, it works for me. Sometimes you can, you can find, you know, kind of crazy little ways that maybe only make sense to you that work for you. Yeah. And then, and then you just need to put on a metronome and you need to say those chord changes. You just need to put on your metronome, you've got your click, right? And so I would do that with this song. I'd be like, E minor, A minor, D minor, A mi or <laughs> G over A, B flat minor, E flat minor, C minor, G minor. And then I do that a whole bunch of times. So if you just say it and then make your, make your metronome go faster and faster so that you have to recall it fast, then go do something different. Go watch something, go watch a Netflix show or take a walk or something where you, where you think about something completely different for a half hour and then come back and do it again. That's kind of a key. Don't just think that you've got it because you sat down and studied it for an hour and made up your silly devices to remember stuff or, or made all of these connections in your mind that are going to help you remember because as soon as you leave and go do something else when you get back and you try it especially what if it's on the bandstand that night and, and you you've gone you know you whatever you play Fortnite for an hour or something then you come back and you go to the bandstand and you're like i've got this you don't you'll forget it all so you've got to take a couple of days with it and go away do something different come back remember it um, let's see. Oh, thanks, Alan. I'm glad that you like my sequence on it. Um, the, the B flat to the e, e flat minor, something I never would have thought of, but the melody took me there when I, when I was writing the melody, I just I sang it in my bedroom. Actually, I thought of it in my bedroom. And then I, I was singing that melody not sure what the chords would be. It came to the piano, and then I was like, oh, crap, I went to B-flat minor? Okay, there we go. I guess that's what we're going to do. Um, uh, could I take some bossa nova song like Chega G Saudaji? I could. Chega G, G Saudaji. Um, what do you want me to do with it, Gabriel? I could take it. Take it anywhere you want. Um, do I know a time for love? Yeah, kind of, um, but not well. I think I've just been listening to Shirley Horn sing that recently. Uh, B before E except after C. Yeah, that's that might work, Sean. That might work for you. Good idea. No, no, Fortnite. I've never played Fortnite either, uh, and neither have my kids, at least not at my house. <laughs> um, well, B, somebody says B flat to E flat minor. Isn't that like every song ever? Well, not if you're in the key of C major, right? Yeah. Um, 
Let's see. Go back a little bit. We could just play Che Gaji Saudade just for the fun of it. Um, no, I don't think I'm going to play any Bach. Judah has a question. He says, um, if you have no vocal experience or ability, like you can barely hold a note, how would you practice integrating licks into yourself? Um, well, I have a lot of videos about that. And I talk about a lot of different facets of learning licks and applying licks and remembering licks and choosing the right licks. But it does get harder if you if you think you can barely hold a note. I you know I always like to I always like to listen to people who say they can barely hold a note. And like ninety percent of the time, when they say that they can't, they totally can. And it turns out they're way better than they think they are. I do have a video called "He Says He's Tone Deaf," where. Uh, a student of mine who, who said he was tone deaf wasn't tone deaf, and we worked on it for a long time to figure out little little ideas to help him. Watch that video; it might be helpful. Sometimes, sometimes you sometimes you can't sing in tune because nobody ever taught you when you were young. But but you can have an idea, and sometimes your idea can come out through whistling. It can like sometimes people who can't hold a pitch with their vocal cords can whistle just fine. So try that. Practice your whistling. Whistle some scales. See if you can match pitch on your scales, you know. Um, and then, if that helps, that would be awesome. You listen to whoever Miles Davis play a lick that you like, you can stop it and try to whistle it. Because if you can just duplicate it with your body, then you can find it on the piano or on your horn or on your guitar, or whatever it is that you're playing. You just have to be able to duplicate it within your own brain first. If you're learning by ear, I mean, if you if you go to my lick videos and take you know licks that I've already pulled pulled out of my head for you, then um, then you can you know just learn them from sight, and then you can learn to whistle them after the fact. But it is important to to create that sound in your own body so that so that it's just not a rote thing and that it's actually something that you hear and you get the idea at the right time in the right place over the right tune, over the right chord changes. That's a magical thing when something that you've heard, you just bust out in the moment and you're like, I guess I know it now. Could I sing into Chega Ji Saudade with chords? I have a hard time scatting to it without doing the daba daba stuff? Rich, eh? How am I supposed to answer that question? I don't quite know what it means. Could I sing into it with chords? Uh. <laughs> Maybe that's not my best key. Let me try C minor. Da, da, da. It's a hard melody. Do you want me to improvise over it, Rich A? I'm going to wait for you. Charlie just got home. Hey, Charlie, I'm live, though. Um, I'll be done in about 20 minutes or something. Is that okay? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you wanted to hear. I mean, I usually start with a vamp, I think. Like a one and then a two, five. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what your question is. It's a great tune, but um, I mean, maybe you're talking about syllables, daba daba. Since you said daba daba, you did say it. I don't know. I could talk about syllables for a second. I you meant syllable stuff. <laughs> now I see your comment. The comments are super late on YouTube. I'm sorry about that. They just don't come up very fast at all. Uh, syllable stuff. So I recommend when you're starting to scat sing, 
and even it, I recommend it for myself if I can is to sing very 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 easy syllables so that you're not thinking about syllables you're thinking about note choice and emotion I think that if people sing crazy scat syllables it turns people off that's from my own experience I think people listen to people making all kinds of crazy scat syllables and they think click you know they turn it off or or they think I'm never coming to another jazz concert again doesn't happen all the time but the people that truly enjoy scat singing with crazy syllables are, are also the people that do scat sing with crazy syllables in my experience and there's not that many of them so to me keep it easy light Chet Baker right just I mean the dude had to sing because his teeth were all falling out and he, I think he wanted to make it sound as beautiful as he could, so. Uh, what song am I singing? Like that. It's my favorite, and I get mad at myself if I if I stray from it too often from old habits because I I used to sing crazier syllables, but I I don't want to anymore. Um, it's, it's okay if people do. I just I don't want to. So that's the advice I always give to everybody. Da 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 la 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 la. Uh, do if you feel comfortable. You can just find something that's non intrusive and stick with it. I think that's my best advice. What would an example of crazy syllables be? The best one is when there's that uh, that recording that Bobby McFerrin did with Yo-Yo Ma. It was called no, no, no. It wasn't with Yo-Yo Ma. It was with Chick Corea. I think that it was called Play. What's he singing? Maybe I can find it. It's so funny. You guys know it. And he he just like goes crazy doing the like most outlandish weird syllables you could ever think of and it's hilarious uh bobby mcferrin chick korea yeah what's it on oh i don't know that that's on spotify oh no no it's autumn leaves but that's the wrong recording that's what it is he's like he's going da ba da ba da ba da <laughs> And he goes like, what's he say? Squeep a doot and fart and blue gay. Something like that. Like, it's hilarious. It's a really good request. Uh, it's really, really, really good um, recording, though. Especially when he breaks into 16th notes and he goes, something like that. Um, whew, let's see. What do I think of Errol Garner's style and characteristics of it? That's a, that's a good question. Um, and then somebody, oh, there's another super chat, just a token of appreciation from Mackie, McC Mackie Connell. Thank you so much, Mackie. I appreciate that. Um, somebody wants me to just play or sing something that would give them goosebumps. I can never guarantee it. Could I improvise on St. James Infirmary? That's a fun idea. Well, let's try that. That could that could bring goosebumps. You never know. Uh, that's a little high. Maybe G minor. Now I went down to the St. James Infirmary. Saw my baby there Oh, he was stretched out on a long white table A love so sweet, so fair
used to play in a Dixieland band. That's where I learned that too. Um, let's see, another good one. Uh, how do I practice my piano technique? I think the way that I do is different than other people. And I don't know that I can, well, I guess I could take my camera down. That's a little hard though, but I could. Um, can you see, how far can you guys see my hand? I think you can only see my left hand, is that right? I think that's right. Um, well, for me, I guess I can do that. Give me a sec. We've got a good view uh, there. That's a pretty good view. Is that all right? Let's see. And my camera or my microphone back to my face. Okay, so for me, when I when I learned from my classical teacher, his name was Don Erickson. He was wonderful. Um, he's passed away now, but I miss him. He taught me to keep a. Uh, a right angle, there we go, a right angle, right? But to keep my wrist high. So for, so for me, I've always got this kind of a thing going on, at least as much as I can. And, and he would have me practice my scales and make sure to pull back on every note. So I know that many people don't learn this way, but for me, it's been a lifesaver because it saves my hand and I can play for really long amounts of time without hurting. And I think that's just due to this, this technique. Anyway, here's the technique. Your, hand, your wrist is high, your fingers are relaxed and curled. And with every note, you pull back. If you can see, my finger hits the key like this, not like this. single one is like it's like petting the key for a second see that and that's how I, that's that's my technique um, so I, I try to play I try to play and get lost in my playing and make sure that I'm still upholding my technique and sometimes I don't and sometimes you can't you know sometimes you have to stretch and that's okay but as soon as you come back to the to your single lines if you can make your make your hand relax again, to me that's the key. My my teacher used to have me. Um, I don't even I don't know. If, let's see. Probably can't set this up so that you can see it, but I'll try. Huh. I don't even think I could do it if I could. He would he'd put his own hand on the piano, and then he'd have me put my hand right on top of his. So this is my left hand on top of my right hand, but he'd have me match up every single finger with one of his. And then, and, and put them over like this, and we'd pull back together. That's how he taught me to do it. Um, and, um, and that was helpful. I can still feel my hand on top of his hand pulling back in the way that he did it and how, how relaxed he was. That, that's what taught it to me. Anyway, Don Erickson. I miss him. Uh, okay, a little tricky to put my camera back. Give me a second. quite the angle there we go anyway I hope that helped Adam Neely always says keep a straight wrist yes he does yeah it is a straight wrist it's just a relaxed wrist right yeah on the black keys too absolutely absolutely on the black keys too you can keep you can keep your hand nice like that. I mean, I run into problems at gigs when when emotions run high. Then I notice myself getting tense. I hate it. I hate that I do that. So I, I try really hard not to do that. That's why in my practice, if I can lose myself in the music, the moment, then I can find moments where I where I'm tensing up and cut it out, Amy. Um, nobody ever did that to me, but I do it to myself. Um, 
Why don't enough teachers know how to teach that? I don't know. That was just his thing. Everybody's got, everybody's got their thing. But um, yeah, you're welcome for showing my technique. That's, that's what it is for me. But um, backing up just a little bit. I think, I think I'd better, well, I'd like to figure out, I'd like to figure out one lick with you guys. So don't give me anything like crazy, crazy hard, um, but something, some lick that you'd like to figure out or, or we can find one, but let's, let's do that. And I'll, I'll take some requests right now and, and then we'll figure out a lick together if you guys can come up with one. It'll be a good one. Something up tempo, maybe. Uh, playing something fun last night. What was I playing at my gig? Oh, I I just played Bye Bye Blackbird, but I I tried to do some interesting things with it, and that was pretty fun. <laughs> Why don't I do that? I like to try to copy um, a little bit of what I did with John Clayton on my album. So I like to start playing just bass. Pack up all my cares and woes, here I go singing low. Bye bye, backbird. Where somebody waits for me, sugar sweet, and so is he. trying to do lately is to find um, little tiny spots in my solo to duplicate a note. I try to do it a few times right there. I'm not, I'm not great at it yet, but I think it sounds cool to duplicate a note here and there. You don't want to do it very much, but now and then if you duplicate a note, it can be really hip. Um, let's see, like, like say on the, that part. Like it can just, it can, it can all of a sudden twist your, your line, like your bebop line that you're used to playing. If you, if you just hit a note twice, it can shift everything and make you syncopate in a way that you didn't see coming or make you think of things that you wouldn't have thought of before. Anyway, I've been practicing that. No, don't turn the subtitles on. Uh, I'll bet it would be funny. I'm talking pretty fast. Let's see, did anyone have a lick? 
I'm looking. Those licks that the horns play in All Night Long by Jacob Collier? Hmm. No, we're, you know, if we get into Jacob Collier, I might fail. But let's see. Give me a timestamp. Anybody give me a timestamp? And I'll put my earbuds in and listen. Take a little drink. Yeah, I'm going to need a timestamp to figure out exactly where to get those, the blues riffs you're talking about, or the, the horn riffs you're talking about. I am familiar with the recording. <laughs> the, uh, the chat just hid somebody's comment because they said the word sunny stit. It's okay. They also hid, hid one because somebody's typing the word lick. <laughs> uh, I like, I can choose to show or hide those comments. Mm. Okay. So no timestamp yet. I guess I'll, I'll just start listening. But it's got to be like in the middle, right? The very middle section. Oh, 420. Thank you. 420. All right. I don't hear any horns. Oh, here we go. Okay. Da. So the first thing I do when I hear a lick is I sing it and I write it and then I play it. That's what the first part is. Should we write it? I'll write it because I forget. I don't have a great memory for things like this. So I'm going to go A flat, quarter note. Uh, eighth note, or quarter note, re quarter rest, eighth note, rest. Bah, that's an E flat, but it's way down low. Let me write that A flat way up high so I don't have to go so low. Okay. Da, da, uh, e flat, F, G flat, A flat, da, 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 ba, then D flat, C, A flat, right? Okay, and I'll keep listening. Well, those are the strings. The strings play that. Oh, I see what you're talking about. It gets fast all of a sudden, doesn't it? It gets super fast. Okay, let me let you listen. Uh, I'm going to stop it periodically. If I, I think if I let more than seven seconds play, they demonetize. So, yeah. And that's where they play. Ba -da -da -ba -ba -da -da. Right there. That's what you're talking about. It's fast, isn't it? Um, it used to be easier when I had a CD player when I used to transcribe because I could stop and start and I felt like I was much more accurate than I am with, with my phone or with my computer. But um, let me see if I can get a little of that. But easier thing to do would be to go to YouTube and put it on half speed and listen because I think all these tracks are on YouTube as well aren't they let me take out this because I'm only going to play tiny sections of it oh, so they hit like a, an A flat chord <laughs> that's the easy part we already did that part Okay, it's like right at 436. Is that what that is? It's almost the lick. Um, let me let me make sure though. I think that's what it is, but I'm not exactly sure. Back to 436. I don't think that's quite it. I've got to stop it right on the first note, and that's hard to do really hard to do. Ha. Huh. I 
think it's that. I think I think it's E flat, F, G flat, B flat, A flat. So let's write that. Da 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 da, and then da I think it's that. I think it's a B flat minor arpeggio. Lower part. Oh, it's like ah, almost like that. tedious isn't it it's fun like might be really boring for you guys to watch me do that but that's what it takes da da so for sure it comes down to that a flat i heard that for sure da, 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 da. but then the next note i want to be sure about the next note it, it hops up fast it hops up fast to that f so i think it's i think it's a d flat arpeggio I'm going to listen real close just with that in mind that it's probably just an arpeggio coming up. Yeah. That's that's I think that's what it is. D flat F A flat. Right back? That's my gut. I think it just goes right back. But then I heard a G flat for sure on the top. No, I don't know what it is. Oh. Right? Yeah, yeah I, I almost wrote that. In context. Yeah, it's a double note. Or all the way down to G, all the way down to A flat. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple um there's a couple what do you call it? Multiphonic notes that the that the tenor sax plays right there where they play the same note but maybe with a different fingering so it gives a slightly different timbre. I hear that going on. That's difficult to duplicate on the piano. Okay, let's get just a tiny bit more of it. Yeah, it's not tricky. If we, if we slowed it down, we'd have it for sure. But it's just like... Something like that. It's, it's not so tricky. It's all diatonic to the key of D flat so far. Something like that. Anyway, we've gotten some of it. Let's listen to just a little more. I think that's what you, that must be what you were talking about, just that quick little lick. It's, it's not that, it's really not too tricky. I mean, it's fast and it sounds really hip, but it, it's not real tricky. Something like that. With that note at the top. It's like D flat with E, e flat minor in it. Like D flat major arpeggio, E flat Dorian, maybe. I don't even hear any C's, but anyway, there's that. I think, um, oh yeah, there's all kinds of, you know, there's good software to slow things down. Uh, there's the amazing slow downer, there's uh, the Tempo Slow app, and of course, the cheapest one is YouTube. You can just put anything on half speed, right? Um, can I make more videos like my 251 licks that I uploaded last time, the Extreme 251 workout? That has been a popular video, and I'm glad. Yes, I do plan on making a whole video like that, but for minor 251s, and I, I'll do it as soon as I can uh, kick my own butt enough to work it out and um, make it happen. <laughs> um, Kirk, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate it so much. Um, 
all right, everybody, I feel like that's good. I think, I think we're good. And it's almost been an hour. I've got a rehearsal to go to. It was fun hanging out. And thank you. Thanks, thanks for being here. I hope you had a good time. And I, will, I think I'll just see you next time. All right? And probably a video Tuesday. That's my plan, everybody. All right, everybody have a great weekend. See you next time on Amy Nolte Music.